Hey there, welcome to Tempo Control. Let's get a musical grip together on Games in Time. My name is Peter Spasia, and it's time to count down the top 10 best songs from a specific video game soundtrack. Also coming up today on the show, Pokemon takes to the stars for Generation 7. We may be mistaken about the true cost of virtual reality. PlayStation Vita turns four years old, and Naughty Dog makes a mischievous mistake. Now remember, before we talk game tunes and game news, video game music is art, and art is subjective. We have a team that creates our list in an attempt to be a definitive list for a specific title. And you're certainly welcome to your opinion on that list, so let us know in the comments below, on Twitter at Tempo Control, and you can also email us at TempoControlShow at gmail.com. We are brought to you by RhymesWithAsia.com. Before we recap the week of February 22nd, 2016, in this second episode of the podcast, let's introduce this week's game. Life in Hyrule is simple for our hero, Link. When he isn't fishing to find a lost cat, he's herding goats at Ordon Ranch. He even has a group of younger children that look up to him, including the feeble Colin, but the sweet Ilya scolds Link for what he demands of his horse, Epona. All cannot stay peaceful, however. Danger strikes the small town one day, as this group of children is kidnapped. In his eagerness to save the young ones, Link finds himself pulled into a mysterious space known as the Twilight Realm. Link cannot maintain his human form in this world though, as he finds himself changed into a wolf. This is where he meets the imp creature known as Midna, who helps Link with his goals in exchange for hers. What are Midna's true motives? Why is the Twilight Realm intersected with Hyrule like this? And finally, who is the true mastermind behind everything? The game is The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, and its soundtrack is in need of a proper countdown. So let's see what we have this time. In this piece, listen to the pitch-shifted strings that are coming from far away, almost as if they're trying to convey a melody. As you try to collect tears, it doesn't mask the real ones that you may be having out of fear. At number 10, it's Twilight.
Welcome back to Tempo Control. If you joined us last week for our pilot episode, you remember us talking about Magearna, that new Pokemon that isn't part of Gen 6, so we maybe we thought Generation 7 could have been on the horizon soon. Maybe it was going to be for Nintendo NX, so we might have to wait to hear about an announcement at E3 if it were going to be part of this new Nintendo console. And boy, this wasn't the last time we were going to be talking about Pokemon on this show. Interesting news took place earlier this week when the details of a Nintendo marketing document seem to have been leaked online by a NeoGAF poster known as Trevelyan9999. Among the information listed was a holiday 2016 Nintendo 3DS game by the codename of Pokemon Niji as a 20th anniversary celebration game. Now, Niji in Japanese translates to Rainbow, and the name Pokemon Rainbow has a particular place in the memory of those who follow Pokemon rumors. The rumor was quickly forgotten though, as Nintendo announced a Pokemon Direct presentation. Now the downside, it would only be five minutes long, and we were thinking, oh man, what if it's just, yeah, Pokemon Anniversary coming out, red, blue, and yellow on eShop, you have Pokken Tournament coming out next month, I hope that's not it, but what if it's a new game? After all, back in January 2013, we got a Pokemon Direct that was basically a seven-minute history of the series, leading up to about a two-minute trailer for Pokemon X and Y, the announcement of Generation 6. But the Pokemon news did not stop there. The day before the Direct, people were digging around a European trademark website and found copyrights for Pokemon Sun and Pokemon Moon. Now, usually that wouldn't be substantial enough but then they found logos to go with it, and those looked pretty real. And that's what happens in this internet age. People will find information if it's out there, so if you want a secret kept, don't put it out there. Much to the chagrin of people who want these announcements kept spoiler-free, you know, you have to stay off social media if you want that, I'm sorry. News outlets, they are going to report. Regardless, not only did the Pokemon Direct deliver on a very emotional video that recapped the 20 years of Pokemon history since its release in Japan, but indeed the confirmation of Pokemon Sun and Moon as Generation 7 on Nintendo 3DS. The game is coming in holiday 2016, it's adding simplified and traditional Chinese so more players can get in on the fun, and also Pokemon from Red, Blue, and Yellow on that eShop release can come over to Sun and Moon through the Pokemon Bank. Now that one's interesting because Pokemon changed how they kind of created the creatures very drastically at the start of Generation well, 2 and 3. They made specific changes in there. So 2, they split special into attack and defense. In 3, they added natures and abilities. So to take a Generation 1 Pokemon and bring it all the way to 7, certain things are gonna have to be done. It's gonna be interesting to research what's going to happen with that. But otherwise, not too much else is known about Sun and Moon. I mean, yes, there are trucks with Pokemon. There's a, a bird Pokemon that at times may look like Fletchling, but maybe it's a new Pokemon. And you get some tropical cues uh, from the Pokemon Center and some trees that are there. But really, that's about it. We'll probably have to wait until E3 to get some more details like starter Pokemon and things like that. Though remember that marketing document? The official Nintendo files, of, like the logos for Sun and Moon, were changed from Niji. So there is some truth to that document, and so what else is on that document? Perhaps that's a topic for another time. In this piece, listen to when the wailing horn that represents the monkey mini-boss Ook kicks in. You know, for a character that seems so ominous, his battle style and musical representation is all over the place. At number 9, it's Zant Battle.
far from the city, here on a farm. Goat running freely, cause for alarm. Colin, you like me, can you be brave? And what will happen to these kids, I must say? To Midna I'm bound, I'm going shard hunting for you. Smell like a sound, my paws hit the ground, and I've turned into a wolf. Dig near the shine, and taking some time, I'm going shard hunting for you. Darkness inside, whimper and whine, when I've turned into a wolf. I guess I'm helpless, so I'll abide. You'll ride upon me on the twilight side. <laughs> we'll go grabbing on some things with your hair. I'm not sure how, but it is not like you care. <laughs> To Midna I'm bound, I'm going shard hunting for you. A scent and a sound, my paws hit the ground, and I've turned into a wolf. Dig near the shine, and taking some time, I do whatever you ask me to. Darkness inside, I whimper and whine, when I've turned into a wolf. Turn into a wolf. In her I found a more than a hound. I hunt the mirror just for you. I smell like a sound. I pose hit the ground. And I've turned into a wolf. Dig near the shine, and taking no time. I hunt the mirror just for you. Darkness inside, feeling just fine. When I've turned into a wolf. In her I found, more than a hound. I hunt the mirror just for you. A scent and a sound, I pose hit the ground. And I've turned into a wolf Dig near the shine, it will take no time I know that there's nothing we can't do Darkness inside, but feeling just fine When I've turned into a wolf In this piece, listen to the string melody that enters and perfectly balances the composition. All is calm and right with the world after those minutes of tension, and that relief just washes over you. At number 8, it's Boss Defeated.
Welcome back to Tempo Control. The virtual reality, or VR market, has taken quite an interesting turn lately, with the announcement that the HTC Vive, which is the Steam VR platform, will be released in April 2016 with a price of $799. Man, that is a lot of money. Though it does come bundled with hand controllers, monitors for room placement, and two games, Job Simulator, and fantastic contraption. Now some have reported that the Vive is the best VR experience that they've had, though they also say it kind of takes a room that's ideally constructed for it, thus the need for those two room monitors. So it's important to look at the market that is developing. In addition to the Vive, you have the Facebook-backed Oculus Rift, which is priced at $599, and also PlayStation VR, which is connected to PlayStation and the PlayStation 4. There is no release date or price yet, though at GDC on March 15th, there's going to be supposedly a panel. Also, people are coming out and trying the games and the demonstrations and all sorts of things for PlayStation VR. So it's likely that we'll be seeing and hearing the price and the release date for PlayStation VR very soon. So what will the price of PlayStation VR be? And will its release date slip into fall as the GameStop CEO admitted recently? But the important question is, outside of early adopters who really don't care what the price is, are these price points still too high for the everyday consumer? Is the market still not ready for virtual reality? Well, these are the first machines that are able to fully deliver on the promise that VR provides. It's not like some virtual boy thing like this. This is real and everyone who has generally tested these things admit that to be true. Now some people point to, oh, the exorbitant price of cell phones back when they were first a thing and say, well, you know, now $600, $800, that's really not too much considering it's brand new technology. But I think it's important to note that the video game industry is a little bit different when we've seen time and time again technology that seemed very high and upper echelon for its time not really catching on because there's this stalemate that occurs between users and developers. If there's not enough interest on the user side of things, if there aren't enough sales, then developers won't be as interested to create games. And if that one game doesn't hit, stick, become a massive success, then the platform goes nowhere and kind of fizzles out. We've seen it time and time again, and hopefully that doesn't happen with virtual reality. I think for VR to catch on and really become a big success on a mass market scale, it's going to have to succeed in the visual experience space first before games. And you know, whether it's you're sitting at a sports game and you're taking that in for a cost or some sort of free falling sensation, that's where I think Facebook is smart to get in on Oculus Rift because then you can even have it be as simple as, oh, talk to grandma who's half a world away, something like that. Games are going to be something different in particular. It's going to take that one game to catch on, have it be interesting in our space first, and then reach a mass market. But it's going to have to be kind of a combined effort, and I just hope that it doesn't fizzle out in the game space first before it catches on in visual experience and that sort of thing. Therefore, I think those people who predicted at the beginning of the year that you know VR may not catch on and may not be the big thing, I think this may be still a year of slow growth and learning kind of what the platform is because I know I haven't tried VR yet, so gosh, what do I know? But it's going to be interesting to see how the industry kind of develops around it, both on a game front and then a visual entertainment or experience front as well. In this piece, listen to how everything just kicks up a notch in terms of epicness when that choir comes in. You know, maybe it's just me, but I can't hear this piece without thinking about just slipping and sliding on an ice-covered floor. At number 7, it's Blizzetta Battle, second half.
So let's see, what games am I playing this week? I started Fire Emblem Fates, I did get the special edition there, and I'm just past that crucial decision that takes place at the beginning of the game, and I picked the birthright side because I'm a noob at Fire Emblem and strategy RPGs, so I figure, let, yeah, let's go with the easy one, that'll be fine. So I'm setting up my Astral Villa, I'm talking to people, really enjoying it so far, but it's certainly more difficult than Fire Emblem Awakening so far, and I guess that's a good challenge, but it makes me a bit nervous to try Conquest. And I gotta tell you, it was certainly tempting to try Revelation the first time, because if you have that special edition card, it already comes preloaded, even though, what, March 10th is coming as DLC for everyone else. Certainly tempting to try Revelation, but, you know, I figure it's best to try that one after seeing both sides and getting both perspectives. So since I'm so bad at these kind of strategy RPGs, I had to go beginner, I had to go casual. Phoenix mode? Tempting. Maybe something I'll have to do for Conquest, depending on how difficult it is. I do want to experience the story, but I don't want to quit these games in frustration. Like the first time I played Fire Emblem Awakening, that happened. It took a second try to, oh, go through and get that experience DLC like I did this time around to just grind up the characters and not have that be an issue. So we'll see what happens. I really do got to put more time into it though. Now, video game composers, on the other hand, they don't get nearly enough credit, and that's something we'd like to change here on Tempo Control. The main composer for The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess is Toru Minagishi, who, funnily enough, you may know him as the composer of the GameCube startup sound. Minigishi has also done some voice work, including P.D. Piranha, of all characters. Now, Minigishi grew up idolizing Koji Kondo after playing The Legend of Zelda on NES, and so he ended up working with his idol starting on The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, where Minigishi composed three battle themes. He also ended up being on the composition teams of Zelda games like Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, of course, Phantom Hourglass, and Spirit Tracks. Some of Minigishi's other composition credits include Pokemon Stadium, We Fit, We Music, Super Mario 3D World, and Splatoon. Asuka Ota also helped on the composition for Twilight Princess, though that's her maiden name as she's now known as Asuka Hayazaki. Some of her composition credits include Yoshi Touch and Go, New Super Mario Brothers, Mario Kart Wii, Nintendogs Plus Cats, Super Mario 3D Land, Pikmin 3, and Super Mario Maker. And rounding out this trio is the legendary Koji Kondo. I mean, not much needs to be said about Koji Kondo, composer of the Super Mario Bros. series, the Legend of Zelda series, and NES game music master, and who many look up to today. Koji Kondo was primarily responsible for the orchestral pieces on the Twilight Princess soundtrack, though you may also know that he also composed the Star Fox 64 soundtrack. Some of his credits are interesting, though, in the soccer game, for NES in 1985, he's credited as Nick Kondo. Interesting. Also on The Legend of Zelda in 1986, he's Konchan. So Koji Kondo, the master, also part of The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess soundtrack team. In this piece, listen to the trade-off between the orchestral hits and the bass, just mounting in tension as the piece goes on. You're battling one-on-one -on -one against your greatest foe, fenced in, nowhere to run. At number six, it's Ganondorf.
Welcome back to Tempo Control. The PlayStation Vita turned four years old in the United States this past week. It's a system that I love and I wanted to talk about it. So the top selling games for PlayStation Vita all time, number one, unsurprisingly, Minecraft. Number two, Uncharted Golden Abyss. And number three, Call of Duty Black Ops Declassified. Oh man, I guess that shows the power of the brand. Though the top three rated Metacritic games for PlayStation Vita, at number one, Persona 4 Golden, number two, Velocity 2X, and number three, Spelunky. Now those are some solid Vita games, all right. So why did the Vita, despite meaning life, fail and just die? Well, it has to do front and center with those memory cards. And my goodness, for it to be a proprietary Sony card instead of an SD card or a micro SD card, huge mistake that Nintendo really showed them how to do it properly. Now, when I got my 32 gigabyte card, and I know they have 64, but a 32 gigabyte card, when I got it, it was like $80 and that was a deal. I can't even think of what the 64 gig would be. And the problem is that they didn't really decrease the price over time. So the memory cards made it a really high barrier of entry when people got the system and realized, what, there's more? Also, the mixed messaging was a big problem. I mean, it was at a time where Sony was still not totally focused on games and the gamer like they decided to do with PlayStation 4. So you had features like Nier, which is trying to copy 3DS's Street Pass. You had email apps on it for whatever reason, because you know your phone apparently wasn't good enough. And you had the whole feature of the cellular network. You know, the cellular and the Wi-Fi or just the Wi-Fi. That whole announcement at E3 when the AT and got resounding booze, it was kind of a problem really for the Vita and that really isn't too surprising. But overall it's the strength of games and I think you're talking about that you know user base that is pretty weak and then Sony giving up you know its first party games. Yeah sure you did have Uncharted Golden Abyss, you had Gravity Rush, you had Tearaway, but it's kind of shocking that you know Infamous missed the Vita, God of War missed the Vita, and remember that deal with Bioshock on Vita? For that to fall through, that was kind of crushing. Though surely there had to be some successes with the Vita, and this is my favorite gaming handheld that I've ever played. I really enjoy playing on it more than I do my 3DS, to be honest, and for all the games I have on 3DS, that's, that's kind of saying a lot. Persona 4 Golden, one of my favorite games of all time. I spent so long playing that. The Vita is a great piece of tech, and yeah, there are different shortcomings to it, of course, but the actual play experience on it is, I think it's unparalleled. Now, of course, the unified ecosystem for PlayStation really helped, you know, the idea of the cross-buy and cross-play. I mean, you had remote play, which, you know, works off and on again, but you see Nintendo probably going towards a future where you have kind of a unified ecosystem where you buy a game for one system, you can play it on the other, the handheld and console comparison there. And really that was done so well on Vita with so many games and I really do appreciate it for that. The Vita isn't dead though in Japan. It still sells quite well there. So you think, why don't they come out with more games? Well, the Vita has kind of set itself as an indie machine and so many indies like to flock to Vita and it's a great place to play those indie games. I play also The Binding of Isaac Rebirth so often on PlayStation Vita and really not on PC because you can just take it anywhere, just sit down and play. A shame that they didn't get the Afterbirth update, but you know what, I'm not too fussed about that. Happy birthday, PlayStation Vita. I love you, but sadly, you're reaching the end of your time. In this piece, listen to the perfectly appropriate use of whistling. It's the Wild West, and it's your job to snipe some enemies, partner. At number five, it's Hidden Village.
Welcome back. Of course, it is nice to look back. But let's take a look at the old calendar and see what games are coming out this week for us to play. The remastered version of Heavy Rain comes out on March 1st for PlayStation 4. Every available man to finding Ethan Barnes. I want you to keep an eye on the train stations, the airports, the bus terminals. I want every cop in the city on his ass. Return to Popo Lacra, a story of season's fairy tale. Comes out on March 1st on 3DS. And The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess HD comes out on March 4th for Wii U. Which game are you looking forward to playing the most? Let us know in the comments below. In this piece, listen to how everything just builds to an epic climax of horns and chorus at the end of the piece. For a tune that uses many of the motifs found throughout the game, it really is the perfect tune for exploring secrets in a wide open area. At number four, it's Hyrule Field.
Welcome back to Tempo Control. The bit of news that I was most excited about this week, to be honest, was the brand new Uncharted 4 story trailer. And I know some may be going on blackout, but my goodness, this trailer was amazing. And you, even Naughty Dog said it was among the best trailers that they've ever done. And that's really high praise. The game looks excellent, cannot wait for it on April 26th. Though it created some controversy because there was a bit in the trailer where Nate looked up from his time at home and there was a piece of art that was a perfect copy of artwork from Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. Guys, come on, really? Though you could almost take it a tongue-in-cheek way and think that maybe Nolan North was just looking back fondly on his days of playing as Desmond Miles and wishing he got to play that character in that game. But, but no, seriously, it's a really big deal. You know, that kind of plagiarism, it's, it's a really significant issue. Of course, it reflects badly on Naughty Dog, but should it hinder their reputation? Now, almost assuredly, the artist responsible for that was fired, but at least the response time was really well done and showed a, a nice sense of integrity there that you know, basically Neil Druckmann, the creative director of the game, said, basically, we messed up. We messed up really bad. We did not vet the image there, and, you know, we're going to take down the video. We're going to fix it. We're going to upload a new one. And when did this take place? Didn't take a day. Didn't take 12 hours. This took about six hours to do. That's some really good response time. And you know what? You have to kind of respect Naughty Dog for that. Companies do make mistakes, though some people say it's part of a trend. They look back to The Last of Us and how Ellie changed her look a little bit to resemble maybe Ellen Page a little bit. I guess I can see where some people are coming from, but I really don't see the resemblance that much, and I think it's a bit of a stretch. So one possible bad apple aside, I don't think that's a big knock against one of the best game studios in the world, a team of incredible artists who create engaging pieces of interactive narrative fiction that we love. Games like The Last of Us, one of the best games of last generation. The Uncharted trilogy, gorgeous masterpieces. So does this detract me from wanting Uncharted 4 anymore? Of course not. It really, with that trailer, makes me not able to wait anymore. Bring on April 26th. In this piece, listen to that oboe. The oboe is so rarely used and it just sounds pristine here. It's also important to note that this uses actual instruments instead of MIDI and that's a really nice touch. At number three, it's orchestra piece number one. Welcome back. 
You send us questions via email, Twitter, Facebook, and more. So it's time to answer a few. At I'm Galactus asks, Do you think a VR version of classic platformers like Crash Bandicoot would ever make sense? I mean, maybe someday, but I don't think anytime soon. I mean, certainly not this year, not in five years, and I don't even think in 10 years. It's going to take a lot of mastery on the development side of things, the mastery of the platform, to understand what games work best on it and how to make the player feel engaged in all of that. Maybe you have a kind of runner-like game where it's kind of on rails and you just kind of jump at certain times. You know, maybe like, you know, the, the crash scene. Maybe something like that is possible, but a full game experience where you have the 3D motion that the player would have to move in and then jumping at certain times and at what velocity, how high to jump. I think that's asking a lot and, you know, developers have to kind of get a sense of how to develop games for the platform first before expanding on that. Because not only is it going to be taxing on the development side of things, the player is going to have to do all those things too. Though maybe you could have a controller in your hand to create the running sensation, but then there's a disconnect there. That like, is that really then virtual reality or is that just playing games with a visor on? So I think developers need to understand the platform first and then maybe we see those games significantly down the line, but platformers, not the first games I'd go to for VR. At The Desert on Fire asks, what are your thoughts on game difficulty, both fair and artificial? Game difficulty is a good thing, of course, but I think it's more important to have game difficulty options. Yes, you have some games like the Dark Souls games, which they sell predominantly based on the fact that they are exceedingly hard, and yeah, that's important to have those examples. But to have the option, the range of the spectrum from the very difficult, I mean, goodness, one of the Call of Duty games to have it be realistic and that like basically one shot and you're down. Yeah, have that for players who want to do that, who play games because of the challenge and the difficulty, to have that sense of accomplishment of beating a game and beating a boss and things like that. If you play games for that reason, great, absolutely do that. But to have the other end of the spectrum for new players to games and for people like me who, you know, really are becoming adults, have, you know, less time to play games, you know, play games for like the narrative experience really and the general mechanics of the game, but not the challenge. I play games on easier difficulty and yeah, you can say new, whatever, and because you're not in that position, you don't understand the perspective. So I think to have games be for all players and have options in games, options are always a good thing. Giving gamers choices, always a good thing. You can certainly have some games, some series that pride themselves on that difficulty because Dark Souls is fair when it's difficult. It's you know giving you that choice of whether you want to continue the game. It's not totally cheap. You have the trial and error that you learn from and that's where the sense of accomplishment comes from because there's nothing less fun than an unfair game, an artificially difficult game. Yeah, it's not more difficult when you just throw more enemies at the player. That's not difficulty. So I think that's where the Dark Souls games get it just right. But for me, when I find something too difficult, I feel like it's wasting my time. And the little time I have to play games, that's where I'm generally going to move from or give up on a game. So to give players those options, I think that's what's most important. Have difficult games, but have the option for new players too. At Major Moses asks, who is your favorite Super Smash Brothers player? When I watch Super Smash Brothers Melee tournaments in particular, I find myself more often than not rooting for Armada. Though PPMD is a good one too, I like rooting for him. If you haven't read the ESPN article on their new esports page about PPMD, do give that a read, that's really good. And also I like pulling for Hungrybox as well. Though I'm not a member of Mango Nation. Sorry. We love receiving your questions and we hope we get more. So send us a tweet, send us an email. You know how to reach us. In this piece, listen to how a simple piano can evoke such feelings of desperation. You know, it really is the perfect piece for this pivotal and helpless moment of the game. At number two, it's Midna's Lament.
Welcome back! Because The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess is our featured game this week because of its HD version coming later this week, I wanted to reflect on the original game and just what it means to me. See, because The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess was the first 3D Zelda game I ever purchased. I mean, the first Zelda game I played was Oracle of Ages. I mean, how strange is that? Great game, great game, but an odd first Zelda. And then I played Ocarina of Time on the PC. You know, fiddling around as you do and using that L to levitate through those means. But I got a console even after Wind Waker was released. And so Twilight Princess coming up on the Wii. All right, the Wii is going to be my you know, first purchase as an adult uh, for a game console. And you know, that's what I was going to go for. And Twilight Princess, a great launch game. And that's what I went for. And man, I love that game. Of course, it's interesting to see the similarities between it and Ocarina of Time. And you have the Temple of Time, you have Arbiter's Grounds, and how it's so easily the Forest Temple just kind of reskinned, but the concept is really the same. But I think almost that was maybe a way of them apologizing for Wind Waker because you have the revisionist history of, yeah, it's, it's a great game, Wind Waker's great, but then you also had the people who knocked it. And of course, Wind Waker, one of my favorite games of all time, which you know, I just have intense feelings for that game as well but Twilight Princess also great and I don't think people really give it enough credit yeah it has a slow start but it's meant to do that to just teach you the small things about the game like the fishing which is kind of strange on the Wii remote but it's to give you that slow plotting life before the action picks up interesting that we talk about the soundtrack though and yeah when you compare it to last episode with Chrono Trigger yeah Twilight Princess is not on the same soundtrack level but it's interesting that because it was still designed with MIDI sounds as opposed to a full orchestra, it let it do certain things like when you were going in for the kill on a boss, the MIDI was able to change right then and just blend perfectly and that really made for great moments in the boss battles. And it's also why a year later Super Mario Galaxy was such a big deal as Nintendo's first fully orchestrated soundtrack. The game certainly has its frustrations. I mean, the Guardian statue puzzle, I will never do by myself without looking it up. I mean, five pieces of heart to a full heart container, what gives with that? You have really odd item choices like the Dominion Rod, I don't know why that was a thing. And some of the side quests like carrying Hot Spring across the field while <laughs> enemies are trying to dive bomb you, that's a terrible one. And then this, the Wee Waggle, no, no. like. I'm, I'm really happy to play the GameCube version more often than not when I go back to Twilight Princess. And that's really why I'm looking forward to the HD version and see how that goes. But there are some great moments to Twilight Princess. I mean, some of those boss battles and how they made you feel. The boss designs, Stalord, awesome. Agarok for an 8th temple boss, great. Really good. Some of the items though, claw shots, I will argue for years. Always better than hook shots or claw shots. And the ability to combine your bombs and arrows into bomb arrows, just fantastic. The darkness of the story is also something I really appreciated. And playing as a wolf didn't feel like a gimmick. To go between wolf and a human to solve different puzzles just felt great and was a really nice change of pace. But the best part of Twilight Princess to me is the character of Midna. And there's a reason why Zelda fans have wanted a companion character like Minna to come back, and why they were so disappointed with Fee in Skyward Sword. Minna had just this charming, great personality, a well-fleshed-out character, and it made such an impact on me that Minna Wolf Link, that was my most wanted character for Super Smash Bros. Brawl. I mean, that's, that's a big deal, and I love that we get the amiibo of it. I mean, that's why I'm getting that version of the game in particular. I'll always remember this moment though when I was listening to the soundtrack before playing Twilight Princess and there's the staff credits which is it's a great song and at the end this rip of the song had the dialogue in there and yeah the characters don't speak but the emotion in the voices and you hear the sound effects of what's going on and the music that kind of almost gave away what the ending of Twilight Princess to me was, and it's a heartbreaking one, especially when you become so attached to the character, that I'll never forget that, and that kind of cements Midna as why is such an important character, not only in the Zelda franchises, but to me personally. So personally, I understand why some people don't like Twilight Princess, but I hope you can at least give this HD version a try. 
because it's up there with one of my favorite Zelda games of all time. Now, when you make a top 10 list for a soundtrack, not everything will make a cut. That said, here are a few choices that we had a hard time leaving on the cutting room floor. Before we get to our number one song, here's a quick recap. Number 10, Twilight. Number nine, Zant Battle. Number eight, Boss Defeated. Number seven, Blizzetta Battle, second half. Number six, Ganondorf. Number five, Hidden Village. Number four, Hyrule Field. Number three, Orchestra Piece, number one. And number two, Midna's Lament. At number one, listen to how this piece expands on the themes found throughout the game, and it's really just a perfect accomplishment for beating the game, even though it's a setup to something that'll just break your heart. At number one, it's Staff Credits, Part One.
And that's the list. If you liked what you saw, let us know. I mean, always love to hear how we can improve, what you liked about the show. And of course, like, comment, subscribe, all that good YouTube stuff we really would appreciate in helping the show grow. YouTube video recommendation this week, check out Team Four Star's video on their Where's the Fair Use uh, issue. They had their channel taken down unfairly. It's a big deal for everyone on YouTube. And for a channel with over 2 million subscribers and how creative and talented they are, even having the backing of the anime company with Funimation, to have something like that, YouTube, you know, get it together. But they went through a really trying time and the least you can do is watch their video and spread the word. Hmm, so what could our featured game be next week? It's our third episode, so we should have a three in the title somewhere. How about Persona 3? That's right. Anyway, to play us out, let's highlight our favorite fan rendition from this game's soundtrack. And it comes from the team at Zelda Reorchestrated. You know, they basically take Zelda songs and arranges them for a full orchestra, and they sound fantastic. But they have their Twilight Princess album, Twilight Symphony, and personally, my favorite from that whole soundtrack, which you should really listen to the whole thing, but I'd like to highlight Ordon Ranch. Thanks for listening to Tempo Control. I'm Peter Spezia. I'll see you next time.